G'day guys, welcome back to the True Footy YouTube channel as we react to round seven. If you're new to the channel, this is a video in which we take you through all the major talking points of the round that was. As even as it does appear this season, it does seem to me like we have three clear contenders. You got Collingwood, Geelong and GWS. That being said, it is only May and we know that there is no such thing as May premiers. So let's take a look at what happened in round seven. Now the Bulldogs have been teasing us all so far this season, but they finally put it all together with a breathtaking performance over Richmond. They obviously went into the game as underdogs, but they absolutely obliterated Richmond in that second half. The Tigers looked a bit lackluster all night, and the Doggies really killed them through the middle of the ground, particularly in the centre clearances. I think they kicked five goals straight to nothing from centre bounces. Aaron Norton, if he hadn't already, has certainly made a name for himself now with that performance on that night. He kicked a big bag of five goals and incredibly took nine contested marks for the game, which I think is one below Wayne Carey's record. He's just a second year key position player in his 25th game. Last year, he was top five in the Bulldogs best and fairest as a defender, and now he's turned his talents to the forward line, so he's showing his versatility. A few weeks ago, I included Norton in my top 10 players of 2024 video, so if you haven't seen that, you should check that out. Now, while Norton stole a lot of the limelight, Bontempelli made a serious case for three votes that game as well. He had 27 possessions, seven clearances, and three goals, playing a mixture between the forward line and the midfield. Most of the Bulldogs' guns were firing, but it was good to see Josh Dunkley make a big return to form with by far his best performance of the season. Hayden Crozier is really starting to carve out a niche as well for them down back, which I think has been a B plus for them. Watching them last week in Perth against the Dockers, I thought the Bulldogs looked fairly strong, so it's nice to see them get some reward for their effort. They've proven themselves to be a fairly up and down side this year. They've lost to Carlton and the Gold Coast, but then smashed Richmond. I feel like we're gonna see more results like that in the future. Now moving on, Damian Barrett has come out and said that Brendan Bolton is beyond the point of no return after his massive loss to North on the weekend. In other words, Barrett thinks he's already a certainty to be sacked at the end of the season. This comes after criticism from Barrett during the week that the Blues were back to loving their honorable losses. The thing is, I get Barrett's point of view and he's saying that Brendan Bolton shouldn't be given a free pass because they're rebuilding and they've only won four games out of the last 39. But to say that he's gone past the point of no return in round seven is quite ridiculous in my opinion. In fact, I can't help but think that Barrett's got a bit of emotion behind that call. Yes, Carlton were absolutely terrible against North, but that happens quite often following a really disappointing loss the week before. Carlton put absolutely everything into that first half against Hawthorne and a fall short would have been quite demotivating for them. I saw that coming personally and that's why I tipped North to win comfortably this week. And while I definitely agree that Bolton should be given a free pass. This is the first time that Carlton have probably really disappointed this year. In summary, I just have to say that to say that Brendan Bolton's past the point of no return this season is absolute horseshit. So while the Demons were absolutely jubilant in light of their surprise win over the Hawks, the Hawks and Clarkson, as you'd expect, were absolutely seething. In fact, I don't have the footage, but Clarkson kind of tore the Demons down with him in that press conference. More or less, after the game, he said that neither side was going to be relevant at all this year. It's probably true, but usually coaches are a little bit more respectful in their press conference. I can't help but think that at this stage, particularly in light of that loss, that the Hawks probably aren't going to make the finals this year. But for me, I've kind of felt that way ever since Mitchell went down in the preseason. They have impressed me and at times they've looked their usual dangerous silky self. But I can't help but contrast them to the Adelaide Crows who they played in round one. They absolutely picked the Crows apart in Adelaide in round one, but since then the Crows have kind of emerged as this top six contender and the Hawks are kind of settling in the middle of the ladder. But it is only round seven, so things can change. The Hawks will probably go on to beat the Giants next week and we'll all be talking them up again in seven days. Now, there is growing talk that the Fremantle Dockers may boast the best defensive unit in the game. Xavier Ellis came out during the week and said that Alex Pierce is the game's best defender, and on current form, it's hard to argue against that claim. Well, personally, I don't think his peak performance is necessarily as good as guys like Rance, McGovern, or potentially even Harris Andrews. It is hard to dispute the claim that Pierce has been the best defender this year to date. Without a doubt, he is the best lockdown defender in the game, and he hasn't been beaten by an opponent this season. He and Hamling have combined to make a very very potent defensive one-two punch. They certainly deserve to be in the same conversation as Rance and Grimes and McGovern and Barras. But it's not just the tools that are doing the job for Fremantle. One player that has emerged as an absolute A grader in his position is Luke Ryan. You could say last year was kind of his breakout season, but this year he's really consolidated his position as one of the premier medium defenders in the game. He's quite offensive for a defender, but he does it very well. He had a mammoth 34 possessions against Adelaide on the weekend, and for a non-tall, he is excellent at intercept marks. Fremantle as a side on average this year can see a total of 65 points a game. That's the fourth lowest tally for any club in the last decade after seven rounds. While they've seen improvement in the forward half as well, I think it's Fremantle's defense which has made them a finals contender this season in my opinion. Now the Giants keep ticking their season along and yet again, I'm amazed by how deep their midfield is. Now we know in recent times they've lost mids like Shield, Scully, Smith, young guys like Setterfield, Kelly, 
and Callum Ward's done his ACL, but their midfield still seems to bat really deep. On the weekend, they left out Josh Kelly and Lockie Whitfield due to injury, but their midfield still did really well, and they even introduced the new young talent, Jackson Haightley. The fact that he came in and played a role was a huge plus for them as well. Don't get me wrong, I'm well aware of the concessions that the Giants have had to make this possible, but they are still really good at developing players, and I'm just, on the whole, just marvelling at the situation. They find themselves in a really good position where they actually don't have to rush back Josh Kelly or Lockie Whitfield unless they're 100% right. Canelio, Taranto and Hopper make a very formidable midfield trio in their own right, and the defensive edge of DeBoer really consolidates that. They're actually better placed this season than I thought, and they've got a few good players yet to come back in. Now, earlier today on Monday, Gary Lyon was apparently posed with a question, who would you choose out of these three players? Joe Danaher, Darcy Moore, or Pat Cripps? His answer to this question was quite interesting in my opinion. He chose Darcy Moore. Now Darcy Moore is having a fantastic season as a defender, but I was a little bit surprised by this answer because while he's been brilliant this year, I don't think he has the same ranking in his position as someone like Pat Cripps, who is genuinely one of the best midfielders in the game already. And while I admit that Danaher probably needs to build up some more form before we can really consider him a real gun, I would still probably err on the side of picking the potential gun key forward over the gun key back. Historically, I think it's a bit harder to come by absolute gun key forward. This might sound strange given Gary Lyon bad reputation, but I actually really respect him as a pundit. On the couch, I think he's the best AFL analysis show going, apart from this one. So I'm really not trying to tear his opinion apart so much as test the waters to see what you guys think. If you had to choose between Darcy Moore, Joe Danaher, or Pat Cripps when you were starting a new team, who would you choose? Make sure you let us know in the comments below. Now, as we alluded to earlier, Aaron Norton was voted the true footy player of the round. He scored 17 votes out of a possible 20. His teammate, Bontempelli, scored 13 votes out of 20, and that was enough for him to take over top spot in our overall ranking. Jeremy Cameron's six goal performance against the Saints was enough to see him slot back into the top three. Believe it or not, we see no change in our top five of our rolling Phantom Brownlow medal award. None of the top five did enough to get a vote this week, but Tim Kelly and Marcus Bontempelli did enough to be equal on 10 votes with third place. They're not all pictured, but we currently have seven players tied on 10 votes. We also have a new AFL Fantasy League leader this round with Killer Prad regaining the lead with his team Deep Threat. It was a real low round for scoring this week and I'd imagine Lockie Whitfield missing and Pat Dangerfield getting injured was a huge factor in that. Congratulations to Killer Prad though. He's having an epic season and averaging 2170 a game. Now the footy tipping winner of the round was Farmer wants a Fife, who scored an impressive eight tips with a margin of 17. But somehow I still lead the competition, which is lucky because I only got six right this week. It's tied at the top with Dave O'Gangel and Farmer wants a Fife equal with me on 40 points, but I do have a slightly better margin, so suck on that. Nah, just kidding guys, well done. I'm sure it won't be long before I am overtaken. All right guys, that's all we have time for this week on True Footy Reacts. Sometime later this week, you'll see our weekly tipping video pop up on our channel. So if you haven't subscribed, make sure you do. Hit the notification bell that way you get notified when it comes out. I hope you like the video guys and we'll see you later. Cheers.